I'm not a good singer, but I always enjoy uh, good music and good songs and the ministry of music. Uh, my father had a practice that before he preached God's word, he would uh, start with a song that was uh, very appropriate to the occasion. Every time when he ministered the word, he did that. And that brought a special flavor and a special orientation to the dignity and the solemnity and the sanctity of the occasion. So I was thinking that, you know, we are not all Malayalis, but we all can sing together one stanza of an English hymn, old hymn, very appropriate to the occasion, sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of God. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and beauty, beautiful words. I'm in good company where I have a lot of friends and a lot of uh, ministry partners and prayer supporters and uh, I feel uh, very much encouraged and blessed to address the men's meeting in the 39 and the IBF conference. I'm entering my 40th year of full-time ministry as the Lord called me from a very young age uh, to serve the Lord in full-time service and if you ask me one of the most uh, overarching predominant burden the Lord has put upon or placed upon my heart there are several of them but probably in relation to my ministry and the ministries uh, which I do among the assemblies I would say that you know I am very 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 much convinced about the need for the dignity of the pulpit. I have learned that probably more from denominational preachers and the pastors and the ministers of other denomination. Their doctrine and theology in relation to the New Testament pattern of ministry is wrong, but their approach to ministry is more dignified and more sanctified and more solemn than we would normally consider. Never trivialize the pulpit. You know, dignity, sanctity and the solemnity of preaching the word of God. It is a sacred assignment and we should maintain the honor of it every time. I was born and brought up in such a cultural milieu in the brethren history in Kerala where our appachans and uncles, even though they were not highly educated men, they were not technical scholars of the word of God, but they were, had profound knowledge and brilliant expositors of God's word. And when they stood upon the pulpit, you know, that was quite something. And uh, I, I, I have a great passion about that. And uh, I always encourage young people also that never trivialize the preaching of the word of God. You know, we, have, uh, we don't have a clergy class or a clerical system or a ministerial order. So we have more freedom in our midst as the New Testament teaches. But we should not use that freedom irresponsibly. It is a sacred assignment. When I visited Geneva a few years ago with my wife, 
I had the opportunity to go to a church where John Calvin preached for a number of years. There are excerpts from John Calvin's messages inscribed there. And uh, reading through some of them, I noticed that this is uh, in one of his messages, he has, you know, described how to preach from the Bible. And this morning, that thought came to my mind as I was thinking about preaching and uh, expounding God's word. We were very much blessed during this conference to listen to wonderful expositions of God's word. We are right on track. So I want to encourage you again. This is what Calvin has said and many other reformed theologians of today repeatedly emphasize that. That is, our preaching should be biblical. It should come from the word of God. We should not read into the text. Our outline, our ideas, all those things should directly come from the word of God. It should be theological or it should match with the overall doctrinal content of the Bible, of the word of God. It should be expositional. It should expound the word of God. Not what I think about it, but what God has already revealed and thought about it. Calvin goes on to add that it should be pastoral. It should meet the shepherding needs of the congregation. And it should be edifying. It should build up the saints, the people of God. It should be practical, and the last one, it should be doxological. It should glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he writes, any preacher or preaching that cannot meet this requirement should be kicked out of the pulpit. I do not know about you, brethren. I am in that category. No, raise the dignity of the pulpit. That is a very great need of our assemblies. Why I'm saying that in the men's meeting? Because we the men in our assemblies, according to our doctrinal convictions, we are in the forefront of leadership. We are in the forefront of ordering, arranging, planning, not our sisters. They are only supporting us. Their ministries are very much limited in one sense, the public ministry. But the governmental ministry of the church, the Lord has committed to you and committed to me. So we have the burden. We should have the responsibility in that. So we men, the elders, the deacons, the fathers, the elders, the counselors, we all when we come to the word of God in teaching, in preaching, in sharing, in counseling. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of us should be pulpit preachers, but all of us when we handle, maybe in Sunday school class, maybe in youth meeting, maybe in sisters meeting, maybe in men's meeting. You see, it's a, our ministry is word oriented completely. We don't have anything else. Now, my dad used to say that the Pentecostals have a lot of tongues and experience and magic and miracles. The denominational churches have a lot of big buildings and a clergy and bishopric system. The Roman Catholics have the Pope and all the pageantry that goes with it. Then he said, what do we have? We have none of those things. The only thing we have is the word of God. If you don't have it, you don't have anything, he said. These are serious matters, and those are the things the Lord puts on my heart wherever I go. And I want to, not to criticize, but to motivate and to inspire and to challenge our assemblies and to raise the standard of our ministries. And I share this with my son, with my daughter, with my wife. And uh, my own, you know, one of the elders of our assemblies here, every time when I get into the pulpit, they know that this is one thing in my introduction. Because 
that would that is what the world needs the authority of the pulpit why some of the postmodern you know uh, kind of churches they have removed the pulpit and uh, it is uh, more of a stage you know why that is pulpit represents authority god's revelation and the liberal postmodern churches they do not want to see that that is why it is more of a drama it is more of a stage the pastors come in jeans and on bikes and motorbikes and you know because they are taking away the authority because when when the pulpit is there and when the bible is there there is authority and they want to do away with that we are under the authority of our lord jesus christ the written word of god also the incarnate word and the inscripturated word those are our precious possessions now this morning i have been studying a very important subject for the last few weeks and that is what the lord laid on my heart to share with you that is the meaning of ministry in the new testament ministry in the sense service okay the word ministry means service the meaning of ministry in the new testament now again you know i was uh, doing a study on this for my own personal uh, blessing and benefit but i found that it is very relevant and applicable uh, to all of us as an assembly as a, uh, our assembly is uh, Uh, everywhere but particularly in men's meeting because again as i reminded you we are in the forefront in the leadership of ministry we are organizers we men we lead our families you know we lead our assemblies we counsel others our children and our fellow believers and uh, our spouses they are under our loving leadership so our understanding of ministry has a tremendous impact in our own life my own life and as a man as a husband as a father as an elder as an evangelist as a bible teacher because my understanding of ministry will be reflected in all the ministries in which i will be involved in what is the meaning of ministry in the new testament we are only able to touch the very foundational fundamentals of the meaning of the ministry i would like to first to read uh, colossians chapter 4 and verse 17 colossians chapter 4 verse 17 and said to archippus take heed to the ministry you know service take heed to the ministry which you have received in the lord that you may fulfill it the name archippus occurs again in the letter to the five letter to philemon Bible scholars are of the opinion that he may be probably Philemon's son or a part of his household. What is the ministry service the Lord has committed to our keepers we do not know whether it is any official leadership ministry or it is in the category of a general ministry we do not know. Most of the denominational commentators are of the opinion that it may be something related to an office in the church maybe but more than that look at the beauty of this verse paul is reminding uh archippus take heed i'm reading from nkjv to the ministry service which you have received ministry service is something which we receive look at the preposition not from the lord but in the lord now when paul writing to galatians he reminds us that he did not receive the gospel he did not receive it from men but from the lord that is more in relation to the origin 
the source of the ministry it is from the lord but the sphere of ministry is in the lord and why the lord has given to us that ministry there is a purpose a purpose clause so that what is the purpose that you may fulfill it so here we find the importance of the ministry it is something given to us of course from the lord and in the lord it is given to us to fulfill it to complete it do you know the ministry which the lord has given to you because as we understand from the word of god if our doctrine is right and i believe it is right that we do not have a separate class that are separated for ministry we all are ministers our sphere and responsibilities of ministry may be different but we all have been given ministry by the lord from the lord and in the lord as assemblies we are the only group in the world who really enjoyably exercise the blessings and the benefit of the doctrine of the priesthood of believers there are other groups which believe it but in their setup there are limitations but in our setup there is no limitation you know we all are called to the ministry so or keep us take heed to the ministry which you have received dear brothers do you know the ministry which you have received that is foundational for the stability of our assemblies our assemblies are quite unstable the reason is including the leaders and believers in general they do not know the ministry which the lord has committed to them so they have a temptation to compare their ministry with others compete with others want to get involved in everything and do not want to appreciate the ministries which the lord has committed to someone else you know because the fundamental reason is a doctrinal problem that is if i do not know the ministry which the lord has committed to me i will be running around trying to find what are the ministries the lord has committed to others you know whether i can do that whether they are getting more prominence name and fame but if i know my ministry the lord wants me to fulfill that ministry very simple words but very profound if you are a biblical counselor there is a wonderful truth here paul an apostle but in a very fatherly way he is counseling or keep us and encouraging him to know his ministry and to fulfill his ministry so probably there are so many young people in our midst whom we may have to take under our wings and we need to encourage them not to give them an opportunity for anything or everything you know but to encourage them so that they may fulfill the ministry which they have received from the lord and teach them this truth so ministry is a gift and a blessing from the lord in the lord and from the lord and unto the lord and it is to be fulfilled and we must know what is that ministry which the lord has committed to us and we should also encourage others to fulfill their ministry when they go slack and slow on it now let me draw your attention to another important verse this is more of a topical study 
So we will be doing a little bit of a topical exposition. That is not usually what I do, but since we have to study this topic, at least the basics, I think that would be the best option we have. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have been studying that wonderful book of Ephesians, especially in relation to our calling and our walk. Now, this morning another thought occurred in my mind how I can fit in this topic, the meaning of New Testament ministry to the overall theme of the conference. Then I found that I don't have to artificially try to connect it, but there is a, a very smooth way that I can connect it very well. We have been learning from the book of Ephesians that we should walk in light. We should walk in love. We should walk in wisdom. We should walk in humility. We should walk in harmony and in unity. And the last chapter on spiritual warfare, we should walk in victory. If I have to do my walk, walk the walk, you know, I should also be confident about the service, the ministry to which the Lord has called me because as I walk, I'm also serving the Lord and serving God's people. I'm not walking in a vacuum just for my benefit. There are certain aspects of the walk that are particularly very individual, pertaining to the individual, our morality, our ethics, our personal commitment to the Lord. But other aspects of the walk, especially in chapter 4, walking, you know, in unity and also in harmony, maintaining the unity of the spirit, you know, and some of the other aspects of the walk which we have studied, it also has a corporate aspect. And in the corporate aspect, the way I walk affects others too. So my ministry, my service is an integral part of my walk. Ephesians chapter 4, reading two verses, verses 11 and verse 12. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. See that beautiful phrase. The work of ministry or the work of service for the edifying of the body of Christ. So here we read that these gifts or gifted men are given to the church by the resurrected, ascended, glorified Christ. The resurrected, ascended, glorified Christ. Why did I say that? That's what exactly Paul is saying. You know, the resurrected, ascended, glorified Christ gave special gifts to the church. And here, it is more of the gifted men to the church. What about those gifted men? Apostles and prophets in the foundational structure of the church. Others, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why did the Lord give the church these gifted men? There is a purpose. Not that they do all the ministry but they may equip the saints for the work of service. So the work of service, all believers in an assembly should be equipped in the area of their service. They should be able to discover it, know it, learn it, understand it, and it should be fine-tuned, and it should be guided, counseled, all those things. Who are the ones to do that? We read the pastors, evangelists, and teachers. Now usually we think that the evangelist ministry is outside the church. But in this context, that theory doesn't fit in with the context of this verse. Because this is the gift given to the church. So evangelist ministry is mainly outside to the world the proclamation of the gospel. But how does his ministry fit into the church? 
to equip the people of God in the area of evangelism. So evangelists also have a ministry in the church. The work of evangelism, the ministry of evangelism should be taught and uh, the assembly should be equipped by gifted evangelists in the area of evangelism. So this is not talking about evangelists outside ministry. This is talking about the ministry of evangelists inside the church. Okay, and then we read about the other gifts, gifts the leadership gifts, the equipers, that is the pastors and teachers, the leaders, the elders. What is their ministry? They are not doing all the ministries like we find in the denominations. They are equipers. They themselves must be equipped first. That's why a part of my ministry now, you know, is in leadership training and teaching among the people of God. A very forgotten area of our ministry. Because if I have to equip someone, I myself have to be equipped. If I have to train somebody, you know, we don't have to use any pious vocabulary and to spiritualize it. I'm telling you the, the truth as it is, very practical. If I have to train somebody in spiritual things, I myself have to be trained. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go to a college and get the degree. That's not what it is. But whether you want to go somewhere or want to be in the quietness of your room, on your knees, as iron sharpens others, learning from one another, whatever method you follow, the important thing is you need to be equipped. You need to be trained. An unequipped and trained ministry is irrelevant to our own children. Let me repeat that. An unequipped and untrained ministry in the assemblies, whether it is in Ireland or in England or in India, it is irrelevant in the world. And that is one reason our assemblies are being closed down around the world. I have firm convictions about it. You ask your own children. You know, I had a talk with uh, a couple of young people in Australia, in New Zealand, and also in the United States, in India, in relation to some of these things. The gist of what they said or communicated to me was our elders and our leaders they are faithful and sincere but they are incompetent to minister to us this is men's meeting I don't have anything to hide this is what our own children are telling us we all are pained to see our children going to other assemblies other churches now I'm not saying that it is all because of the parents' fault or the assembly's fault. Part of it may be. I do not know. I'm not the judge of it. But are there things which we need to pay more attention to in relation to our understanding of ministry? The teachers and pastors, evangelists, they are the equipers and their role is to equip the people of God to do the work of service. Now when they are equipped, the following verses, they will grow, they will be fast on the track of discipleship, their sanctification and their growth, and that results in the ultimate growth of the assembly. But it all starts in this ministry, the work of ministry. When people are equipped for the work of ministry, what does the New Testament teach about ministry, the meaning of ministry? The meaning of ministry is our service rendered unto the Lord. For that, the Lord has given equipers who can equip the people of God. So the ministry of the equipers should be recognized. They should be allowed or in other words, we should allow our elders to lead us. We should respect that office, that ministry, 
and allow them to lead and equip us and be submissive under their leadership so that throughout various methods which they may employ they will equip us and uh, as a result you know the believers are equipped to serve the word of uh, the the uh, people of god the assembly now that is i would call the ministry that's not in the bible but by reading it i get the sense that that is the ordered ministry ordered ministry means the ministry of elders and leaders pastors teachers and evangelists i call that the ordered ministry the lord has ordered for the ordering for the government for the functioning of the church so that like in 1st corinthians 14 40 let everything be done decently and in order if that decently and in order has to happen an ordered ministry should be there and the ordered ministry is vested in the hands of the leaders it is not a separate clerical class but it is an ordered ministry we brethren need to admit that that's very important it's not a separate class it's not a clerical class but he has given some not all to be a prophet apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints so that is an ordered ministry and when i follow my elders you know i also contribute to the order the decorum and the functioning of the assembly without confusion go to an assembly and see the confusion there why look at the divisiveness the thousands of opinions the rebellion the questioning the bitterness why we don't believe in ordered ministry we don't recognize ordered ministry we have thrown the baby with the bath water anti clericalism you know we are against all kinds of order but the new testament very clearly teaches about ordered ministry in the new testament that should be a part of our new testament ecclesiology don't worry what our commentaries say and what missionary has, has taught you and talking to you what the new testament teaches you know ordered ministry and then that ordered ministry leads us to the general ministry in which all of us are involved in i follow my elders their ministry their service in equipping me and others as a bible teacher you know they also encourage me to join in their team to equip others so that the assembly may be built up edified and there will be an order dear brothers why i am so passionate about it this is the need of the hour of the assemblies this is what we are lacking that is why we are disintegrating that is why our sacred doctrine is not making a practical impact our own children are questioning it the validity of it not because the doctrine are wrong but we are tempted to wrongly apply that so may the lord give us to recognize you know why so much divisiveness because we do not recognize any ordered ministry you know that is simply that is the reason so we need leaders we need shepherds we need people who can lead us equip us teach us we have to be submissive to them follow their leadership and that will bring in decorum everything may be done decently and in order and our leadership has a great contribution to make in that area and we have a great responsibility to follow that let me tell something which you might not have heard in our vocabulary listen to me carefully new testament church is an organism but throughout the new testament epistles that organism is organized you will not find it in brethren commentaries but you will find it in the new testament 
throughout the New Testament, organism is organized. I'm not telling you a new doctrine. I'm telling you exactly what the Word of God is teaching. I'm convinced about it. It is in the pages of the scriptures. How they are ordered, not under a kind of sacred liturgy or clericalism, no. Pastors and teachers and elders, you know, they bring in an order. For the functioning of an assembly, there is an order. Living organism, it's not an organization, but for the smooth functioning of the assembly, organism has to be organized. Look at Acts chapter 6. The organism in its very early stage, the apostle said, you find out men who would devote themselves to the ministry on the tables. We, the leaders, the apostles, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the word, the ministry of the word. Is it an, an or, don't you see an organized way of doing things? Organism needs to be organized. For the last many years, we have neglected this. So today it's very difficult for people to recognize it because for the last many years, you know, these truths have never been emphasized. That's why people ask, who made you elder? Why should I follow you? What benefit you have over me? You know, and uh, it's very difficult to be submissive because we, we think that we all are equal. We all are equal, no doubt, in Christ, in his grace. Brother A. Chaco in his seminar emphasized about God's government and the difference between grace and government. That is exactly what it is here. You know, in God's government, even though everything is equal, and he used an illustration that President Obama is a U.S. citizen. I'm also a U.S. citizen. So can I go to the White House and say, can I come in? You know, I can also go and walk around, roam around there. You have that. You are a U.S. citizen. I'm also. Yes. But at the same time, in the government, there is a difference. So we need to accept that. You know, it is not superiority or inferiority. It is like in marriage, you know, husband, wife, children, in the assembly, in the, in the universe, everywhere we find that. That is an integral part of the way God has designed us to exist and to live for his glory. As we move along, you know, Another important thing, I was thinking about Brother Krishnanguti this morning, you know. You know, Brother Krishnanguti has his own funny way of, you know, presenting uh, uh, his message. And in some places when he has a lot of things to say, he will, Malayalam, he used to say, Aashayangal kishayil atti atti hai kadakunno. That means in my pocket there are layers of ideas, you know. So I'm probably like that this morning, you know. Uh, uh, so many things the New Testament teaches about uh, uh, ministry. Now, in the Old Testament, if you make a word study of the words, I do not want to be too technical about it, but in the Old Testament, most of the words used for service or ministry is in relation to the temple and to the priesthood and to the tabernacle and the ministry is always toward God and never to others. That is the theology of ministry in the Old Testament. You know, in the temple, in the tabernacle, in the holy priesthood, very sacred, solemn ministry, service. But it is always towards God, not towards others. But in the New Testament, ministry is towards God and also to others. That I would consider that to be the most uh, important difference between the concept of ministry and in the Old Testament uh, and in the New Testament. That becomes very evident if you're interested, if you make a word study 
of the Hebrew words used for service in the Old Testament and the New Testament Greek words used in the New Testament for service. The Old Testament concepts of ministry is more ceremonial, more related to priestly service, liturgical. It is unto God. But in the New Testament, that word is used a couple of times. Not a couple of times, probably half a dozen times at least, in relation to Paul's ministry of preaching the gospel. You know, he uses the Old Testament terminology. Uh, that is a very a, a, a sacred service he renders unto God. But it is never to others, only to God word, not to others. People serving people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is a New Testament concept exclusively. People serving. I'm serving the Lord, you are serving the Lord too. But basically, we are serving one another also. Now, very quickly, moving on to a couple of more uh, areas of ministry or the fundamentals of the meaning of ministry. In the New Testament, ministry service is a part of our discipleship in following Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12. Verse 26. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, dia conevo, serve. You know? If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant. See? My slave, Dulos, will be also, if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. We are not only saved, we are called to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as his disciples. And an integral part of our discipleship is being a servant of the Lord and servant uh, to others. It's an integral part. It is in our calling. It is built into it. I cannot demolish it. It is there. The Lord has saved me. The Lord has called me. And I am following him. And when I follow him as his faithful disciple, I am called to serve him, to follow him. And where he is that my servant also will be, and if anyone serves me, my father will honor him. As we serve the Lord, the father will honor us. Serving service is a part of our discipleship. Now the Lord also taught us that greatness, our greatness, our worth, our value, is to be measured in terms of our service. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Verses 42 to 44. Mark's Gospel, 10, 42, 43, and 44. Greatness, our worth, our, our value is to be measured in terms of our service. Look at these verses. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It, 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 it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, we all have that desire for prominence, for greatness. I want to be great in my ministry. I want to do my best. You know, all of us have that. Not in a negative way, but I'm talking more in a positive way. That we want to be really making impact in our life and in our ministry. Whoever desires to become great among you shall be 
your servant. Look at the word servant. And whoever of you desire to be first shall be slave. Another word. Shall be slave. Servant and slave. For even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve. And to give his life a ransom for many. Dear brothers and sisters, our greatness, our greatness, our value, our worth in what we do, the respectability and the honor, it will come to us. We don't have to work towards it or for it. We do not have to carnally try to get respect from others. It all depends upon our understanding of the ministry, the service which the Lord has given to us and how we do it. What is the attitude in which it, whatever be the ministry, whether it is private or public or something simple, you know, whatever be it, Lord, you have given me this ministry. Let me do it for your glory and for the blessing of God's people. You know, like a servant and like a slave. And then the Lord's blessing will be upon us. Our concept of ministry should be the same as our Lord's concept of ministry. That's probably where I should conclude. Our concept of service is, should be the same as our Lord's concept of ministry. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The upper room discourse, when the Lord started the upper room discourse, first he washed the disciples' feet. But you know, you don't have to turn there. But on their way to the upper room, according to evangelist Luke, you know what they were doing? Luke chapter 22, if you read from verse 24. They were discussing and they were fighting over the question of who will be the greatest. So if you connect Luke 22, and I believe in the context, you know, they are on the way to the upper room. And on the way to the upper room, what was their discussion? Who will be, who is the greatest among us? It is with that mentality they entered the upper room. And that is the reason that the Lord washed their feet. It's interesting that the Lord arranged the place, the utensils, the meal, everything. He was the host. But you know, in those days, the host will also provide one more thing, a slave to wash the feet of the guests. That is the only thing the Lord did not provide in that upper room setting. Isn't it amazing? He is the host. He invited them. Everything is provided. And according to their cultural practice, a slave also should be there. But he did not provide that. He wanted one of them to do it, to volunteer it. That is an integral part of their custom. But they were looking for places of prominence. And that is the reason that the Lord Jesus, you know, he girded himself with a towel and he washed the feet of the disciples. His concept of ministry. Ministry in the New Testament is humble service. As the servant of the Lord, ministry done unto the glory of the Master and for the blessing of others. In the Old Testament, it is always upward towards God. In the New Testament, it is also toward others and the attitude you know, and the mindset with which we do, that ministry is very important. And also, it begins with, in the verse which we read in the beginning, each one of us taking the time prayerfully 
humbly to ask the Lord, what is the ministry? I don't want to be like others. I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to compare and contrast ministry with someone else. I don't want to compete with anyone. Lord, this is the ministry you have given to me. Let me do it for your glory and the blessing of your people. The meaning of ministry in the New Testament is a vast topic, subject. It's a very humbling experience. This is something which uh, you and I need to learn on our knees. And I hope and pray that the Lord may stimulate our hearts you know, both in relation to our personal ministry, general ministry, and the ordered ministry, which we need to pay more attention to in our assembly setting, so that our ministry will become a sweet-smelling savor before.